So let's, let's uh, open up the 10 words today, and ex we're going to be exploring the significance of the 10 words in our covenant relationship with Elohim. And, um, and so, so let's, let's dig in. The Pharisees asked the Messiah, what is the greatest commandment in the law? It was a little test for him. They wanted to see if they could trip him up. And he said this in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. He said, Love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so we can see uh, a hierarchy that he's laying out for us to understand that that the great two commandments are about love. It's about our relationship with, you know, our, our vertical relationship with the Almighty and our horizontal relationships with one another. And so all of the law hangs off of these two. And we can see that the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words, hang directly off of those two commandments and then all of the rest of the instructions hang off of, you know, one of the Ten in some form or fashion. The first several of the Ten Commandments describe some aspect of what it means to love Yahweh, your Elohim. And the remainder of the Ten Commandments details the primary areas of behavior which illustrate what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the centrality of the Ten Commandments, of the Ten Words, is, uh, is kind of revealed and opened up to our understanding in this little encounter that Yahushua had with, uh, with an individual who came, and the, the text goes like this, and it's from Mark chapter 10. As Yahushua started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And sometimes we skip over this passage and we kind of, we think in our minds, uh, you know, good works or whatever. Or what, what must I do to, to uh, have salvation? Or, you know, there's various thoughts about what this means. But this individual asked specifically about eternal life. And he said, uh, the master said, why do you call me good? No one is good except Elohim alone. And then he said this important statement, because this bears to our study today. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And so the master is, is describing to this man how to inherit eternal life. We have heard the message over and over in the gospel that is preached far and wide and for centuries that believing in Jesus gains us eternal life. And that's absolutely 100% true. But what we fail to understand is what does it mean to believe in Jesus, or Yahushua, as we call him, uh, based on his Hebrew name. Um, what is that all about? What is that belief all about? It's about, it's about, we've talked about the prophet that Moses described, the one that was going to come, the one that was going to be like Moses, that would come and that he would bring forth the word from the Father and that we would have to listen or shema him. We would have to hear and obey him because if we didn't, we would have to answer in the judgment to the Father if we don't obey this individual. And so, Yahushua's very clear and direct description of what it takes to inherit eternal life is to obey the commandments. How does that fit in with belief, believing in him? It fits in because if we believe in who he is, who he says he is, and the message that he brings, then we're going to be walking in his footsteps. We're going to be doing the things that he did. We're going to be obeying the commandments because don't we all know that, that he obeyed the commandments perfectly? There was no fault in him. He was the Lamb of Yahuwah who takes away the sin of the world. And the only way he could be qualified to take away the sin of the world is to be a perfect, blameless, spotless lamb. One who is without sin, without transgression. 
And so we want to walk like he walked. And now I mentioned uh, and read, uh, talked about the, what he said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus to point out the fact that, that he revealed the Father's will. This very same Messiah that, we, that came in human flesh and was born of a woman was the one who was the Word. He was, he was revealing the Father from the very beginning and explaining and describing who he is. He was the one uh, of the three friends that came to visit Abraham. And he, was, he appeared to many people and many prophets uh, at various times. And the scriptures give us all of those accounts. So we need to understand that to believe in him doesn't mean just to believe that he died for our sins and now all is well. But we need to completely incorporate who he is and the message he brings yes. to us into our life. That's what it means to believe in him. Yes. Amen. It means to obey him and follow him in everything that he teaches and to do and to shema his word, to, to obey his instruction. And so that's where eternal life comes in and that's why here in this passage, uh, Yahushua is saying, this is how you in inherit eternal life, by obeying the commandments, because yes. that was the message he was bringing. But the Father isn't just looking for, for people just to fill in the chairs in the kingdom. You know, whoever, everybody come in. But he, the invitation is to everybody. But what he's looking for is a people that will obey him and conform to his image and do his pleasure and keeping his instructions. And so, so this is the very message of the ten words. This is the message that Messiah brought. I've talked about this before as well. There's a difference between the salvation of Yahuwah and the righteousness of Yahuwah, meaning inheriting eternal life. Salvation comes when Father delivers us from uh, bondage, some sort of bondage, bondage from Pharaoh, bondage from sin, bondage from, uh, from, from all the enemies that took our ancestors into captivity. And so the salvation comes from him. He does the mighty work. He stretches out his powerful right arm to accomplish deliverance for his people. But the, the examples of scripture show us what follows. The example of the, the Israelites who came out of Egypt. He brought a, a, a great salvation to his people by performing mighty miracles. And then what did he require of his people? He gave them, he gave them instructions. He gave them the Sabbath. He gave them uh, various laws on how to worship him and how to love one another. And that generation, because of the stubbornness and rebellion in their heart, fail to enter into the promised land because Father was not pleased with them. So that whole generation of, of men, uh, particularly those who were 20 years of age and older, the, the, the fighting men, that whole generation of people died before the nation actually entered in. The next generation was willing to obey the commandments and receive that covenant. And so the covenant that the Father had delivered at Mount Sinai was the covenant of the ten words. It says in Shemot, Exodus 34, 28, Moshe was there with Yahweh for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, this is speaking about uh, when he went up on the mountain to receive the tablets. Uh, he was going without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant. This is, he's talking about the covenant at Sinai, the Ten Matters. And so we all know that the Ten Commandments were written on the, on the tablets, right? Well, it was, it was, uh, the scriptures never really call them the Ten Commandments. That's something that we have adopted as a designation for those words, those words that were written on the tablets, the words of the covenant. The Hebrew here reads, um, Eseret HaDevarim. You, get, you all know the word Devar, or Devar, Devarim. It's the name of the fifth book of the Bible, Devarim. It means words. But the word Devar also means a matter, or a word, or a thing. And it 
it's used in all those different ways, and it's, it's translated according to the context of, of where that word occurs. But I want you to see that the, that the scriptures themselves call them the Ten Words, not the Ten Commandments. And there's two other places where it says that in Deuteronomy 4.13. He says again, He declared to you His covenant, the Ten Matters, the Ten Words, which He commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. And again in Devarim, Deuteronomy 10.4, Yahweh wrote on these tablets what He had written before, the Ten Words. He had proclaimed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. And this, of course, is referring to the Sinai event. And Yahweh gave them to me. And so the scriptures call them the ten words, the ten matters, the ten issues, the ten major categories of instruction that Father was making with the people to be a covenant. These are the covenant stipulations. Okay, so, so it describes them as the covenant. It says he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant in, uh, in Exodus 34 and then in Deuteronomy 4 again. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Matters. Let's look at the word covenant for a second here. The word covenant comes from the Hebrew brit. Brit, and we, uh, some of those, some of you who have been in the Hebrew roots uh, messianic world for a little while, know that the New Testament is referred to as the Brit Hadashah. That means the new, or renewed, as some people would say. The new covenant. The new covenant. And so what is this Brit? The theological word book of the Old Testament describes our word in this way. A covenant is, a, is something that occurs between nations. It could be a treaty, an alliance, a friendship, between individuals, it could be a pledge or agreement. With obligation between king and subjects, it could be maybe described as a constitution. The, basically the law that's set out to establish the conditions of the relationship between the king and his people. Between God and man, a covenant is often accompanied by signs and sacrifices and a solemn oath that sealed the relationship with promises of blessing for keeping the covenant and curses for breaking it. In other words, the covenant um, that Elohim would be, that Yahweh would be our Elohim and we would be his people was, is based upon these stipulations or conditions of this agreement because he didn't agree just to be our Elohim no matter who we are as a people or what we do, there were conditions that we would need to, to listen to him and let him be Lord. There's another common expression uh, that we hear in the, in the places of worship, that he is Lord. He's not just Savior. He is Savior, but he's also Lord, which means he gets to call the shots. He's the boss. He's the one that lays down the law in a and the, the condition upon which we are entering into relationship with him, him is that we agree to his way and to uh, set aside our own way and our own thoughts and our own lifestyle in order to conform to what he has in mind for us and what he's planned for us. Understanding the difference between a covenant, promise, and law. A covenant is an agreement between two parties a promise is something guaranteed, either conditionally or unconditionally. And a law is a standard of rule concerning behavior. So there's interrelationship between these ter ter uh, three terms. The covenant offers promises, but it's stipulated upon a law. That agreement with, we have, that relationship with, we have with the Almighty, uh, has along with it promises, and we're going to look at that in just a second, but it also has laws or conditions or stipulations, rules for conduct for us in order to maintain that relationship, that agreement, that covenant that we have with the Almighty. Purposes for covenants, it's, they uh, usually establish conditions and expectations for business or personal relationship. These are, these are covenants, I mean, in our own world, uh, 
uh, we have covenants, we call those contracts. And uh, pretty much all of law and all of the judicial system is based upon contract law. In other words, what did, what did these two parties agree to? And uh, if there was a breach in the contract, then you know, a, a breaking of the, the conditions of the contract, then the party that broke the conditions is at fault and is liable in the judgment. You know, he has to pay back or, you know, there, there's some sort of judgment that's made when a contract is broken. And you can't claim the promises offered in a contract if you break the conditions of the, of the contract. So that's what we're talking about. Covenant is contract. It's agreement. It's, uh, it's, it's something that both parties have agreed to that establishes uh, the relationship and the keeping of the promises from each of the parties. Because each of the parties usually has something they're required to supply to this relationship or this covenant. There's also uh, stipulations. And when those laws are, of the contract are broken, then, then the contract is broken. And that's what we need to understand about covenant. The covenant can be broken, but Elohim's never the one that breaks the contract because he's faithful in all of his ways. It's mankind that breaks the contract and falls out of relationship with the Almighty because he refuses to comply with the laws and stipulations of the contract, which is the covenant, which is the agreement that we've made with Elohim. The covenants Yahuwah makes with his people are designed to establish relationship between him and them based upon proper respect for who he is. These agreements are the legal basis for determining the rights of each party. So let's look at the agreement. These ten matters, um, these instructions given, are actually the agreement, covenant, oath, or treaty made between Elohim and man. We need to understand that that's what it is. It's not just that Elohim said, this is, I would like you to do these things. You know, I would like you to do these things as my people know. They're the, they're the stipulations of the relationship itself. We can't have right relationship with the Almighty unless we're, we have agreed to and walk in agreement with the laws that, uh, that are part of the very covenant itself, the agreement that we've made, this contract we have with the Almighty. The words or stipulations of this statement are the terms of the relationship. They describe the obligations and expectations of each of the parties. For Elohim's part, he obligates himself to, to be the following. He is to be our Elohim. And we see this in Deuteronomy, Devarim 5, 6. Which is to say, he is to provide for and protect his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and we're going to break this down a little further in, in a slide that's about to come. Secondly, he must show love to those who love him and obey him. And it doesn't say that he has to show love to everybody. Devarim or Deuteronomy 5.10. He's to show love to those who love him and obey him. That's an important distinction to see. Not just to believe who he is or to believe that Jesus, Yahushua, died for our sins, but then to obey him, to walk in all that he is in that relationship we have. And thirdly, he must give you long life and cause it to go well with you. Deuteronomy, or Devarim 5.16, when you do these things. So the covenant was agreed to, the, we're talking about now the covenant of Sinai because this is where the 10 words come from. It's that covenant, it's the words that the Father spoke from Mount Sinai to the people who are, who are at the base of the mountain and listening to his voice and shaking in their boots also, by the way. So the obligation of Elohim in this covenant relationship was described even before Israel agreed to the covenant. And I have here uh, on the slide Exodus 19, 5 to 6, but I'm going to uh, look at Exodus and start at verse 1 so to kind of lay out the context of what's going on here. So Exodus, Shemot 19. It says this in the third new moon after the children of Israel 
had come out of the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt. On this day, on this very day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they set out from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And so Yisrael camped there before the mountain. And Moshe went up to Elohim, and Yahuwah called to him from the mountain, saying, This is what you are to say to the house of Yaakov, Jacob, and declare to the children of Yisrael. You have seen what I did to the, the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. And now, verse 5, as it is on the screen. And now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. So that's the message that Yahweh gave to Moses to speak to the people before they came to the mountain. This was as they were, they were there in the place and it wasn't going to be for a couple more days that he was going to come and actually speak to them. So the passage goes on to say that Moshe came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken we shall do. And so Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahuwah. And so even before they heard the terms of this covenant relationship that Elohim was making with the nation of Israel, they agreed to do it. But that doesn't, I mean, some people will say, well, well, this right here, this agreement, sealed the contract. And it did. It did seal the contract for Israel, even before they heard the stipulations, the, the covenant commandments. Nevertheless, the covenant commandments are still the covenant itself. The agreement is, is, that, is that the people would do everything that Yahweh had told them to do. And they agreed to do it. So now... Uh, from the mountain of Sinai, he's going to tell them what those requirements are, what the, the covenant entails, what is required of them in this relationship he has with his people. So before we get into the actual details of what those commandments are, and in fact, um, today's teaching is just laying the foundation for looking into each of the individual ten matters, there needs to be a few things that are said about uh, these ten matters before we can, you know, really understand and dig into the matters themselves. But so here are, I said I was going to give you more of Elohim's responsibility in this covenant and then also uh, more information about man's obligation or man's responsibility in this covenant. So here it is endeavoring uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and it says this if you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them then Yahweh your Elohim will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your forefathers he will love you and bless you and increase your numbers he will bless the fruit of your womb the crops of your land your grain new wine and oil the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks in the land that he swore to your forefathers to give to you. You will be blessed more than any other people. None of your men or women will be childless nor any of your livestock without young. Yahweh will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in, in Egypt and its Ryan, but he will inflict them on all who hate you. And so here's more of a detailed delineation of the promises and obligations that Elohim has in this relationship that he's making with the people. He has to do all these things as Elohim. And the, the whole list of them, well, the, this is a partial list in Devarim or Deuteronomy 7, but the full list of them is in Deuteronomy 28, and we've read that a couple of times in the past. The full list of blessings that the Father promises to his people if we 
are careful to obey all of his laws. It's this covenant law that it was given at Sinai. So, for man's part, by agreeing to the covenant, he is obligating himself to have no other Elohim, no other God. And he is not to take the name of Yahweh in vain, and, and so forth. There are some, you know, the addition, you know, all of the, the covenant commandments are man's obligation to Elohim. And man's responsibility, if we, if we fail to do any one of them, then we've broken contract. And we can no longer have any expectation, nor does anyone who enters into a court of law, if they break their contract with somebody, they have no right to demand that the other party fulfill their obligation because they've broken the contract. And so Elohim also is under no obligation to fulfill his promises of blessing to his people who are in disobedience and rebellion against him. We can say we love him and you know, quote scriptures, loving him with all my heart, soul, and strength, but if we fail to, to maintain a loyalty in this contract, then Elohim is no longer obligated. And this is, this is looking at it not from a forgiveness and compassionate point of view, but I'm, I'm looking at this, and, and that all has its part, and don't get me wrong, but I'm looking at it from a legal perspective, from what he promised to do, from what we promised to do. And so when we fail to do our part, we can no longer demand or expect, even expect, all blessings to be in our life, because he promised in Deuteronomy 28, if we are careful to observe all of these things, then all of these blessings will come upon you. But Elohim is faithful, but, and he also said, if you fail to obey all of these laws and commandments, but are in rebellion, then all of these curses will come upon you. And so Elohim is obligated to bring the curses when we're disobedient to him. We can no longer expect all the blessings. Even though we claim relationship, even though we want him to be our Elohim, if we're not really allowing him, to be Lord and Elohim of our life, but we're going our own way and breaking and transgressing His law, then we have no right to expect even the blessings of the, of the contract. But we can expect, sure as this is daytime, because the light is in the sky, we can expect Elohim to be faithful in what He promised and bring curses to His people. Man is to faithfully perform the ten matters discussed in the covenant to remain in this alliance with Yahuwah. Should he transgress any of the stipulations, he has violated the contract and has forfeited his right to demand Elohim to keep his part of the agreement. And thus Elohim no longer is obligated to provide for and protect the violator of this agreement. The Son did not come to annul Elohim the Father's character and his faithfulness in what he spoke. In other words, the Son didn't come along and say, oh, all you have to do now is just believe in me. Believe that I'm dying for your sins. That's not the message. You won't find that message anywhere in the words of Messiah. He came to uphold what the Father had spoken. And he urged people, and, and even in that passage we read from Mark 10, he instructed people that the way to eternal life is to keep the commandments. There's no other way but to keep the commandments. And, and we're not keeping commandments in order to, to gain salvation, but we're keeping commandments because we've agreed to do so in this relationship with Elohim. He provides the salvation. He, he provides the deliverance. The only deliverance that could save us was that of the innocent lamb dying in our place on the tree. And so that's what Messiah came to fulfill, as well as to tell us what that means for us. In other words, the, the mind of Elohim hasn't changed in terms of how we are to respond to his reaching out to us in kindness. So that brings us to this question. Can you agree to the covenant and break the commands? Is that a possible scenario? Yeah. Well, 
It is in the sense that you can agree to the covenant. I mean, like our ancestors, they broke the commands, but what was the result of that? Because they, they inherited the curses and failed to enter into the land. Because that's where Father wants to bring us. The salvation is to get us to a place where we can, we can be in contact with the living Elohim and in right relationship. But there is an obligation on our part to maintain that relationship. And again, I keep saying this over and over, but to let Him be Lord. Yeah. Let Him be the one who tells us how to live and what to do. And if, we're, if we want to have that relationship with the Almighty, we have to understand that that's His very character, is to be faithful, to be truthful. All of the commandments are a description in one way or another of His character, His righteous character. And so he, his desire is to bring us into conformity with his character so that we can maintain what he intended to establish in the beginning when he created mankind. To have that walk in the garden, that fellowship with mankind. And so, can you agree and break the commandments? Well, yes, but if you agree to the covenant and then refuse to perform the commandments as given in this covenant, Elohim promises to do the following. He will punish you and your children to the fourth generation. This is found in Devarim, Deuteronomy 5.9. And he will not hold guiltless those who abuse his name. And this is uh, in the uh, you know, part of the ten words where he says, don't, don't lift up his name unto uh, vanity or emptiness. But he, he promises that he will not hold guiltless those who abuse his name. And a very long list of curses, as we talked about already, is pronounced upon his people should they fall away and make that choice to break covenant with Yahuwah and go to serve other Elohim. And, of course, again, the list is found in Devarim or Deuteronomy 28. And when it says to go and serve other Elohim, that's alluding to the fact that if we're rejecting Father's commandments and refuse to walk in his instructions, then what are the instructions and commandments that we're willing to walk in? Those are, the, those are the instructions of other gods, whether the god is ourself or, or some religious institution or whatever that thing is that is, that is that is trying to direct us to obey other commandments and have a, some other lifestyle. That's what it means to serve other gods. You don't have to have a statue in your bedroom and bow down to worship it to be serving other gods. The gods that you acknowledge, in other words, the mighty powers that you acknowledge and submit to are the gods that you're serving. And so any other god that would lead us away, any other desire in our heart, any other uh, religious set of laws or institution that would draw us away from Yahweh's ways to walk in some other way that is usually presented as being good and, and uh, a great you know, way to live. That's what it means to serve other gods or other Elohim. So the curses are pronounced upon those who walk in any other way other than the faithful way of serving and obeying the Almighty. Are the ten things, these ten matters, these ten uh, commandments, part of the New Covenant, another question that often gets asked. Because if they're not, you know, why are we even talking about this today? If, if it doesn't pertain to the New Covenant, then it's irrelevant, right? So we can just put it aside. Obviously, it's not irrelevant. And here's the passage of Scripture that indicates this. When uh, Jeremiah described the new covenant which Yahuwah would bring. He says, the time is coming, coming, declares Yahuwah, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. And again, this new covenant, the one that, that we who follow Messiah uh, claim as the very covenant that, that Yehusha established by the shedding of his blood, this new covenant is made with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda not with the Christian church. The prophets don't say anything about a church or a new religious establishment that the Messiah would bring with which he would make this new covenant. Again, just to, just to clarify some of the misrepresentations that have been given to us and passed on to us from many years in the past. The covenant is with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. 
And who are we? What? We are Israel. We're the house of Israel because we've been adopted and grafted into that one body. We've talked all about this. We are this people that the new covenant was going to be made with. But we need to understand that it's the house of Israel that who we are. And it's not a different, separate uh, body or institution that, uh, that Yahuwah established his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob was renamed Israel and his sons and all who were brought into the same faith as Yaakov, Jacob, Israel, are those who belong to the one body. And that includes Gentiles, that includes the native born, who, who also, by the way, Paul says, also need to be reattached to the vine because even the native born have fallen away and are guilty of transgression and need to repent and return to the vine. So everybody that's in the real house of Israel and who belong to Israel are grafted in people, whether native born or alien, we're all grafted in. So it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Mitzrayim. And by now, um, the word Mitzrayim should be very familiar to all of us. It's, it's the Hebrew word for Egypt. And um, I'll, I guess I'll probably continue to say Mitzrayim or Egypt, uh, just to help in case we forget. But Mitzrayim is Egypt because they broke, because, and I have underlined this, they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares Yahuwah. The word uh, husband is the word Baal. It's a common word for husband or lord. And, the, you know, the pagans borrowed that term to be a name for their gods, the Baalim, or the, the Baals. But the word itself doesn't always refer to, the, to false gods. It can be referred to someone's husband. It's the Lord. It says, it says about Sarah in the, in the account of uh, the book of Hebrews, it said that Sarah called Abraham her Lord. And she literally did. She called him her Baal, which means husband or lord or you know, master, the one who's in charge, uh, indicating her submission to her husband and the acknowledgement that he was the head of their household. So this, the word Baal just means husband. But, so the important thing, that was just a little detail I wanted to throw out there, but what's important was that it says, they broke my covenant. Yahuwah never breaks any covenant that he makes. The people break the covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares Yahuwah. I will put my Torah, and, and there's the word right there. Are the ten things part of the new covenant? Yes. I will put my Torah in their minds and yes. write it on their hearts. I will be their Elohim and they will be my people. And so this sounds just like what, what he spoke at Sinai, right? that I will be your Elohim and you will be my people. But here are the covenant uh, contract stipulations, the ten words. There is no other Torah that Yahweh calls my Torah other than the one that he gave at Sinai. There's no other law. The law didn't change. He didn't change. And so he says, I'll put my Torah in their hearts and minds. So there's a difference. There, uh, I'm going to lay out two differences in this new covenant that were different from the old covenant, the covenant at Sinai. But it's not in the terms of the contract. That hasn't changed. My Torah, he says, is going to be in their minds and in their hearts. And so no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know Yahuwah, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahuwah. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And so, under the new covenant, is compliance with his commandments necessary? This is alluded to in Colossians chapter 1, um, but we've already kind of described a couple places where, where this, is the, this is clearly the case. The Jeremiah passage, uh, when the Messiah talked to this man who came up and asked about eternal life. So Colossians 1, 21 to 23 once you were alienated from Elohim and were enemies in your minds 
because of your evil behavior. Your evil behavior, that's, a, that's an allusion to the transgressing of God's laws. But now he has reconciled you by Messiah's physical body through death. We're talking about the cross here and his shed blood to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So there is this implied requirement that when we come to Elohim and we, we, be, we are reconciled to him by the cross, that we're going to move forward in a direction where we're without blemish, free from accusation. There's no more sin in our life. There will no longer be transgression of these covenant contract terms. And then verse 23, if you continue in your faith. And so there's the conditional aspect of this relationship we have with Elohim through the Son, is that it's if you continue in your faith. Implying that some people won't be continuing in their faith, or that faithfulness, right? And, and my wife just pointed out that faith, as I've preached over and over again, and one of these days I'm going to bring a full-length teaching on the word emuna, faithfulness in the Hebrew, because that's where... The New Testament gets the idea of faith. It really means faithfulness or fidelity. It doesn't just mean some uh, uh, information that we have in our minds uh, that we call faith. But it's about carrying out and walking out the relationship with the, we have with, with the Almighty. So Paul says, if you continue in your faith, in other words, if you continue in faithfulness in the contract, in the covenant, this new covenant we have, with Yahuwah, where he brings his Torah into our hearts and minds. If we continue in that, then we will be established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. So, is compliance to his commandments necessary under the terms of the new covenant? Yes. Yes. It's part of, of what the, the death of Messiah was, was uh, intended to accomplish. It was to set us back on the right path so that now, with His Holy Spirit indwelling us, we can begin to do all those commandments that we were too stubborn to do before. So He's given us a soft heart. He's, he's put this, uh, you, you know, the prophets also talk about this, this soft heart, right? Um, well, flesh heart. A heart of flesh, yeah, thank you. I was, that, that's what I was trying to think of. But it's, it's no longer a heart of stone. It's no longer that stubborn spirit that we used to have. But he's put a heart of flesh in us and in his spirit so that we can comply and we can do the things we used to refuse to do. And that's why I said earlier is that, you know, we've, we've given up a lot of things and we've given over to the lordship of Christ many areas of our life. But sometimes we hold back on it. And we keep hold of some of those things. And we need to release all of those things so that, they're, so that we are without blemish and free from accusation. There's no longer anything anyone can point to in our life. And we know there's no longer anything in our thought life that, that is soiled, that is in agreement with the enemy and uh, working against the mind of Yahuwah. Eternal salvation comes to those who obey. And this is, this is um, from the book of Hebrews. And here's another one of those things that often get overlooked when we talk about just believing in Jesus. And, and even with uh, the episode that Messiah had with the man that walked up to him and asked about eternal life. It says, during the days of Yahushua's life on earth, and this is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 10, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became, listen carefully to what this says. This is the prophet that we have to shema. And if we don't listen and obey him, then we have to answer in the judgment for it says, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And was designated by Elohim to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And so here, 
uh, eternal salvation. There is the salvation that Yahuwah brings us out of our bondage. But in order to enter into that everlasting salvation, if you want to call it that, or into eternal life, as another way to put it, is to obey Him. And it's the only way we can get there. The, the, uh, the things that were written about our ancestors were written for our sakes, to benefit us, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10. They're there for instruction for us. And what we learn is that Elohim brought the salvation to the whole camp of people, but there were very few that actually entered into life, into the promised land, because most of them refused to obey. But the ones that obeyed entered into the promised land, which is a picture, an illustration for our sakes to understand the difference between being saved and entering in. Because the entering in, between the place where we are saved, where Elohim delivers us, and our life has changed, our heart has changed, uh, there is the, the sanctification process whereby we are walking out the desire and will of Elohim in our life, and thus proving that we belong with Him, and proving our worthiness, if you will, of entering into the kingdom. And I hope uh, putting it that way isn't offensive. And I'm not trying to suggest again that we're earning our salvation. We're not. We're walking in our salvation when we obey the commandments. It's Elohim who saves us. And then we walk out in complete faithfulness and obedience to Him in order to, to enter into eternal life. Because there is going to be a judgment. We talked about this. That Elohim is faithful and just in the judgment, and he judges every man according to his works. And so Elohim has brought about this deliverance by the death of the Messiah on the tree in order to put us in a place where we can walk faithfully and repent and change our lifestyle and our habits so that we can be walking in all of the good works. And thus we'll be judged by that, by the good works of Messiah that we're walking in. We ourselves are walking in it. We're not just dependent upon what Messiah did, as though his righteousness is transferred to us in, in some fashion, but it's transferred to us or imputed to us in the sense that we begin to walk in the ways that he walked and in his footsteps. That's how we receive the righteousness of Christ. It's by agreeing to him and obeying him and doing the things that he did. And so, because of this obedience, and because the judgment is coming to judge us righteously, and everyone is going to be judged righteously, not just from what your intention was or what, you, what was in your heart, because people use that excuse too, well, God knows my heart. Unfortunately, the heart is deceitful. He's wicked. And he's not, he never says anywhere that he's going to judge us you know, by what's in our heart. He says he's going to judge us according to our works. And there must be eight or ten times throughout the whole Bible where that phrase is, is indicating uh, how the judgment will be performed. So it's important that, according to Hebrews 5, we are obedient to Him. And that's, that's how He becomes the source of our eternal salvation, is by obeying Him and conforming to His ways. So what was wrong with the Sinai Covenant? Again, in Hebrews 8, for if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. So there was something about the first covenant that, that was wrong, that didn't work. But it wasn't the covenant itself. It wasn't what Yahweh had promised. It wasn't the instructions. That's not what was wrong with the covenant. It says, but Elohim found fault with the people. And he said, the time is coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda, it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Mitzrayim, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares Yahweh. So the fault with the old covenant wasn't in the, the Torah that was attached to it. It wasn't in the promises that Elohim made or even anything that he did on his part. But the, but the fault was with the people because of stiffness 
of neck and hardness of heart and stubborn rebellion and refusal to give up our own ways and to let him be Elohim. We, we agreed to let him be Elohim, but we didn't actually carry that out, and that's what was wrong with the covenant at Sinai. It couldn't force people to obey Elohim. It only laid out the contract of how you could be in right relationship with Elohim. Important distinction from the way it is often taught. There's nothing wrong with that Sinai covenant. The difference between the covenant at Sinai and the new covenant is it is not in its content. The difference is where the Torah is written and the blood that puts the covenant into effect. The Sinai covenant was written on stone and ratified by the blood of animals, but the new covenant is written on the heart of men and is ratified by the blood of Messiah. The Holy Spirit was given to imprint the Torah on our hearts. He was to dwell in our hearts by faith or faithfulness. He reminds us of the teachings of Messiah. The Spirit of Elohim reminds our hearts and consciences about the stipulations of the covenant agreement we made with Him. And He teaches us of His laws and His expectations. And I've read those passages from Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel 36 where it says when He puts his spirit in people, we will be compelled to obey his laws and right rulings. In other words, that's a, the work of the spirit in us. It's to, it's to give us the power and the will, the wherewithal, to do all that he has commanded so that we can stand upright in the judgment and be uh, worthy of the kingdom of Elohim. So, so that's what I have on the covenants. I'm going to switch gears now and actually begin to talk about the ten words themselves. Although um, the breakdown of each of the ten words, one by one, uh, we're going to do in part two next Sabbath, but we're going to talk about a couple more things, that uh, foundational things that need to be said about the ten words so that you understand uh, what these ten words are. So. I talked in the past about how they're not really the Ten Commandments because there's actually more commandments in these in this passage of Scripture that were written on the tablets of stone. And I had told you before that there are 16 commandments in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5 and 15 in the book of Exodus chapter 20. But actually I looked it over again this week and I, I had missed one. There are actually 17 commandments in Deuteronomy 5 and 16 in the book of Exodus chapter 20. So here's what the commandments are. And let me say this about commandments. In the Hebrew tongue, there are two ways to express a commandment. To use uh, the imperfect form of the verb. Uh, the, the, the verb in, in, per, in the perfect means it's action that has already happened. It's real action that's already happened. The imperfect form of the verb means it's action that has not yet happened. It's thought to be maybe happening or some other thing, but not an actual real action that took place. So here, the future, uh, the future form of the verb, which is the imperfect Hebrew verb, is used to express uh, most of the commandments in the ten words. In other words, you shall or you shall not. It's, it's a way that we express a commandment by saying you shall do something or you shall not do something. The other form in the Hebrew language, as with most other languages, is called the imperative. The imperative just means the commandment form of the verb. And in most languages it, it, it has a little different form, different vowels, like in Hebrew there are different vowels. In Greek uh, it's a little different structure and in most other languages the imperative or command form of, of a verb has a little different form. <clears throat> so eight of the ten words, and actually 15 of the 17 actual commands that are found in Deuteronomy 5, are in the first of these two forms of, of commandment, using the future. You shall not do something. Or, you, or you, know, you know, you shall do something. And then there's two places where the actual uh, imperative form of the Hebrew verb is here of use. So here are the 17 commands. It says, these are commandments. 
Um, you shall have no other Elohim before me. That's the first commandment. The second immediately follows. It says, you shall not, there's a command, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Okay, and the third one is, you shall not bow down to them, nor worship them, which is what bow down indicates, a worshiping of these idols. And the fourth commandment is, you shall not serve them. So there's four commandments in this one, what I'm going to call the first matter. And I'm going to, after I go through these 17 and these 16, we're going to get into why I'm, into, I'm uh, teaching it this way, that this first matter is consisting of these four commandments. Because in, in, in the typical, traditional way of seeing these things, is that there are, there are two commandments. There's the, you shall not have other gods before me, that would be one, and you shall not make for yourself an idol, is the second. But, but I want to show you reasons why these are actually all one matter, one word, and not, they're not two separate matters of the Ten Commandments. Okay, so we have four. The fifth one is, you shall not lift up the name Yahweh your Elohim unto emptiness. And all five of these first commandments use the you shall not form of the commandment. The sixth one is guard the Sabbath day, and this is using the imperative form of the verb. <coughs> next, si uh, the, the next commandment, what was that? So one, two, three, four, five, six. The seventh commandment in the Decalogue is that six days you shall labor. That's a commandment from the Father. He established a seven-day week, week and, and, and has commanded us to work for the first six, to do all of our labor. Six days you shall labor, and here's another commandment, that what is this, the eighth? And you shall do all your work. That's another commandment that says, you shall, in this case, you shall. And then you shall not do any work on the seventh day. Is that nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So those are nine separate commandments right there. And we haven't even gotten past the Sabbath, the instruction about the Sabbath. The tenth commandment in Deuteronomy 5 is to remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Again, part of the Sabbath instruction. That remember, re, it, to remember that we came out of Egypt and, and Yahuwah is the one who delivered us from Egypt out of that bondage. So he has the right than to command us to keep the seventh day Sabbath. He's the authority figure. He, he's the one that brought us salvation from Egypt. So we're to remember that. And, and, and in this fashion, it's easier to be able to submit to Elohim when we understand all that, that He is and all that He's done for us. Eleven is honor your father and your mother. And this is the other one that has uses the imperative form of the Hebrew verb. The rest of them are all using the future form of the, of the commandment. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bring against your neighbor a false witness. And that's uh, 15 of the commandments. The last two are uh, expressed in Deuteronomy 5 as two separate issues. In the Deuteronomy 5 order, of the text, it says, you shall not lust after your neighbor's wife. And it uses one Hebrew verb, you shall not lust. And then using a different Hebrew verb, it says, you shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And so in the Deuteronomy 5 layout of the 10 words, these are two different issues desiring or lusting after your neighbor's wife and wanting to have your neighbor's stuff. Those are two totally separate issues because one is about a, a relationship with a person, your neighbor's wife, and the other is about the, wanting to have what your neighbor has. And so, and that's why in the, ten, in, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Yahushua explained that that when you desire your neighbor's wife in your heart, then you've already committed adultery. Because it's on par with the commandment, do not commit adultery. 
It's one of the big ten. It's, you know, Yahuwah places great value in people. And stuff is just stuff. But people are made in the image of Elohim. And so the matter of lusting after your neighbor's wife is a separate matter. It's on a whole different level as just wanting your neighbor's stuff. It's, you know, his house, his land, and all the other things. So those are the 17, when I say 17 commands, I forgot to change this slide, the 17 commands of Deuteronomy 5. The commandments uh, that are written in Exodus 20 are only very slightly different from the, ex uh, from the Deuteronomy 5 version. Um, almost all the commandments read the same except at the very end. Again, Exodus 20, you shall have no other Elohim before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. Those are the four about who your Elohim is. And then you shall not lift up the name Yahweh your Elohim unto emptiness. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You remember the Deuteronomy version said, guard the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And here we're told to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor, another commandment, and you shall do all your work. Another commandment, you shall do all your work. On it, the seventh day, you shall not do any work. And then the missing one is the remember commandment. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, that was in Deuteronomy 5, but it's missing here in Exodus 20. So there's actually only 16 commands in Exodus 20, whereby, whereas there are 17 in the Deuteronomy 5 version. And then honor your father and mother, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bring against your neighbor a false witness. And then the last one reads this way, and, and this is where Exodus 20 uh, reads differently than Deuteronomy 5. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now Moshe is describing in Deuteronomy 5, what happened at Mount Sinai as recorded in Exodus 20. So why, uh, why the two different accounts? Because what Yahuwah said and what he wrote didn't change over those 30, what, nine, 30, nine and a half years from the time that he original, originally gave the ten words, spoke the ten words from Sinai, and when Moshe, near the end, of the wilderness experiences retelling the story of what Yahuwah said at Mount Sinai. So why these two different accounts? I think, I think it is safe to say that there is a, a textual, let's say a scribal error in one of these two accounts, and I believe that it's the Exodus account that has the scribal error. In other words, as the scribes copied these manuscripts over and over, um, a mistake was made in the copying, and the account of Exodus 20 reads neighbor's house, neighbor's wife, his manservant, and maidservant, and so on. Where, whereas in the account of Deuteronomy, where Moses is retelling, he says neighbor's wife as a separate thing, and then neighbor's house and, and all the things that belong to the neighbor. I think that just makes a lot more sense uh, to understand it this way, that the neighbor's wife is a separate, it's the, actually the ninth word in these ten words, and then your neighbor's stuff. So, what's also interesting to note is that these last two matters are matters of the mind, the matter of the, uh, of the thought life, whereas the first eight were matters of what we actually carry out and perform. So it's important, again, as I noted when we did our study in the Sermon on the Mount, that, the, that you can transgress Torah and be guilty of transgression by the thoughts of your mind. And that's the purpose of these two instructions, is to, is to keep our minds in check. What are we thinking on? What are we dwelling on? What, are, what processes are going on in our thought life? And, uh, and it's important that we, we, well, Paul says we take every thought captive, right? Um, yeah. That's what we're supposed to do, talk, take every thought captive and, and, and cause it to be in submission to the authority of Messiah. 
And so the idea here is that we're to recognize that all of our thoughts coming to us are not from the Father. There are thoughts coming to us from the spirit world, and that's the language of the spirit world. It's in thoughts. And so we're to recognize the fact that the enemy can speak to us in, through our thoughts. And that all the thoughts that come to us, we need to examine every thought. They could be lusts from our own heart. They could also be a word from the enemy trying to lead us into a different direction. So we need to take every thought captive and examine it for what it is and then sort it out. Either receive it as from the Father or reject it and throw it out as, as coming from a, a source that we don't want to follow. Now, I want to show you why um, I've laid out the ten words in, in the way that I'm doing so. And I'm not sure if it's clear yet. What I'm saying here is that the first word of the ten words is that whole issue of who our Elohim is. And it's one matter. And, okay, so let me jump ahead. Let me, let me just show you in the English text what I'm saying. And then I want to show you something from the Hebrew Masoretic text. And I even brought along uh, my Hebrew Bible so that you can see the markings in the Hebrew Bible that I'm referring to. The, the rabbis put markings, they're just uh, like punctuation, they're, they're helpful indicators about something about the Hebrew text. Okay, and there's, there's a, a number of different markings. But in the giving of the ten words in both Exodus and Deuteronomy, these words are separated by a particular marking in the Hebrew text. Okay, there's also in the in the Masoretic text there's also footnotes and all kinds of different notes and, and information about textual variations in other Hebrew manuscripts because they want to present the whole picture to you about uh, about the information that's available in all of the Hebrew manuscripts that are known. So they give you all this information and in bottom notes and in side notes and in the actual punctuation within the Hebrew text itself. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let you look at these markings. I want to show you what, what these markings are. And what it what it boils down to is this is how we should translate or, or understand by those markings what the actual separation of the ten words is, because it's not what we've been commonly taught and told. And, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. This is, this is all just from a study of these things, a study from the Hebrew manuscripts, and, and trying to come to understand what these ten words actually are. The first word is this, I am Yahweh. It goes from verses 6 through verse 10. I am Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of slaves. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. You see those four separate commandments there. And the, the serving them is the fourth. You shall not serve them. For I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations. I'm supplying the word. It's not in the Hebrew to a thousand of those who love me and keep my commandments. So there's that thing that we keep seeing repeated, that theme of what these commandments are, is there, uh, when, when we're obeying these commandments, he's gonna show us his love, that he's promised to those who love him and keep his commandments. The conditional aspect is always found in the scriptures about how we can walk in his favor and how and on a, under what conditions he loves us and maintains his love for us and the blessings that come. So that's, that's matter number one. Number two, you shall not lift up the name of Yahweh your Elohim unto emptiness, for Yahweh will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. The third one is about the Sabbath. Guard the Sabbath day to keep it holy as Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you. Six days, there's the second commandment in this number three word. Six days you shall labor, and number three, do and you shall do all your work. 
But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your Elohim. You shall not do any work. That's the fourth commandment here. Uh, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. And then the fifth one here, uh, a commandment within this number three word, remember that you were slaves in Mitzrayim, and that Yahweh your Elohim brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and therefore Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. So this gives him the right to command it of us, because he's the deliverer. He's the one that brought us salvation. There was no way our ancestors or us could have gotten out of the predicament and the dilemma of the bondage we were in all on our own. It required a mighty working of the hand of the Almighty to deliver us and bring us that salvation from bondage. So number four matter is honor your father and your mother as Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you so that you may live long and then it may go well with you in the land that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. Five, you shall not murder. Six, you shall not commit adultery. Seven, you shall not steal. Eight, you shall not bring against your neighbor a false witness. And nine, and this is the, uh, the other part of the difference that I'm distinguishing between the, the Exodus and the Deuteronomy account and why I'm adopting this particular uh, way of, of uh, presenting it. The number nine of the ten words is you shall not lust after your neighbor's wife. And number ten is you shall not set your desire, different verb again, you shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. These are the matters that Yahweh proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain, from out of the fire, the cloud, and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. And then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. So these are the words, the, and these are the only words that Father spoke from the mountain. He did, you know, when Moshe came back up on the mountain, where Yahweh was going to write these ten words on the tablets, Yahweh also gave additional laws and right rulings. He gave instructions about the tabernacle and about the priests and all the other instructions that the children of Israel were to follow. But the covenant commandments are the ten words. And in keeping the ten words, uh, though all of the rest of the instructions and commandments hang off of those ten. And we talked about that the first slide we looked at. They all hang off of those ten. And so they're all explanations and, and delineations and detailed descriptions of how we are to keep the ten and what, what it means to be guarding and keeping these big ten. And I'm going to keep calling them the big ten because I think they're, they're so central to our understanding of what we've gotten ourselves into when we agreed with the Almighty to let him be Elohim and that we would be his people. We've agreed to the Big Ten. And so these are, you know, this is a summary statement of what the Almighty requires of each of us. The Exodus 20 account, really the same. The only thing that's missing is uh, the remember commandment. But in the Exodus account, it only, it only goes up to nine. You shall not cover your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, and all the rest of his stuff. There were only nine. And that's borne out in the, again, from the Hebrew text, um, which I'm going to put out here, and if, any, if you want me to point this out to you in the Hebrew Masoretic text, I will be happy to do so. These, you can almost see them from where you sit. There's, there's text, and then there's a space, and there's this Hebrew character. Those are the punctuation marks that separate the ten matters. You see them all throughout here. There's the, there's the, it's actually the Hebrew letter Samic, but it's used as a, as a, as a, not to pronounce it as a letter, but, but it's a separating mark uh, within the text to show you, you know, this matter comes to an end, and then now there's this matter that comes to an end. And so these, these punctuation marks break apart the ten words so that we can know what, what the ten were. So, uh, let me show you real quick what this looks like. K 
Can you see that? What I've done is I've taken each of the ten words, um, and they're separated by this Hebrew letter psalmic. Do you see the psalmic at the end of the second line? Do you, do you see that? It's a separation. It's a separation mark. And so, what this tells us is that is the text of Deuteronomy five reads from verses six through 10, and then at the end of verse 10, that's the bottom line then, there's that punctuation mark, the psalmic, and that says that's the end of the first matter. There's no, there's no psalmic in the Hebrew text after the first statement that you shall have no other Elohim before me. If that were a separate instruction, or one of, one of a separate word from the Father, then, then the, the, uh, the scribes, or the rabbis would have put an asamic in there to indicate that was a separate, you know, and now we're moving on to the next matter of the ten. But so, verses 6 through 10 are the first matter. There's a psalmic at the end. Uh, verse 11 is, is a separate matter. This is that you shall not lift up the name of Yahweh unto vanity. And at the end of that verse, that's the second line, you'll see another psalmic. Okay? And then in verse 12 begins the third matter, and it says shemor. Shamor at Yom HaShabbat. Um, guard the Sabbath day. And that goes all the way through the end of 15, bottom line on, on this page, and then there's another psalmic indicating the end of that word and moving on to the next word. Verse 16 is the fifth word. It says, honor your father and your mother. There's a psalmic at the end of line 2, which is the end of verse 16. And then you see each of the next ones. You shall not... Murder, you shall not commit adultery. These very short verses ending in a psalmic. Those are all separate matters. When you get down to verse <clears throat> Deuteronomy, uh, verse 21 is the verse that says, you shall not lust after the wife of your neighbor. Verse 21, and then there's a psalmic. You see verse 21 is the fourth one from the bottom. It's kind of short, verse 21. There's a psalmic indicating that that's one matter, and then now we're moving on to the next matter of the ten words. And then the rest is about your neighbor's house and his stuff. And that ends uh, after 20, let's see, and you, and you, uh, that ends at the, at the end of that verse, and verse 22 is kind of a summary, and it says, the, the last two lines here <clears throat> are a separation. They're, they're no longer talking about the ten words themselves, but it's a summary, and it says, And these words Yahweh spoke unto all the congregation of the assembly in the midst of the fire and the cloud, and so forth. And so it's just kind of like ending the account of what happened there on Sinai. So... I'm going to end with this today because we've already gone a, a full length of time in this teaching. But I needed to lay out that foundation because we're going to talk next Shabbat about each of the individual, individual ten words. And we're going to look at some of the commandments that hang off of them so that we get a deeper understanding of each of the ten and how all of the rest of the Torah is uh, in further explanation and detail about these ten words. So what I, what I hope you took from this teaching today is that uh, the Ten Commandments are very important to us. They lay out for us the agreement that we have with the Almighty, even in the New Co Covenant, through the blood of the Messiah. The blood of the Messiah does not disentangle us from our obligation to obey the Father and the commandments that He's given. In fact, uh, the, the blood of Messiah has brought about a condition whereby the Spirit now dwelling within us helps us to obey all of those laws and right rulings that the Father gave. The Torah hasn't changed. It's always been Yahweh's Torah. And even under the ter terms and our relationship through Messiah and His shed blood, this is the lifestyle that the Father is drawing us into and He wants us to conform to this way, to this ancient path. I love that term, the ancient path. And this is the Father's will for his people.
So yeah, so next week we'll talk about part two. <laughs> and we'll get into each of the individual words. What say you? Please, uh, comments, questions. I want you, if you're interested at all, to, to really get an up-close look at, at the, the punctuation in the Hebrew text as to why I'm saying uh, there's a little different layout of the ten matters and that the, you know, those two at the end are, are two separate commandments. So if you're interested, I'll show it to you. And uh, so what kind of questions do you have or comments?